Well, I'm so pleased to see all of you at 8.30 in the morning, but it's because we have a fabulous speaker this morning. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Susan Ellenberg. I don't want to take too much of her time, but uh, I want to tell you a little bit about her. Maybe there's some things you don't already know because uh, we are so lucky to have her. Uh, Dr. Ellenberg is Professor of Biostatistics at the Center for Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Associate Dean for Clinical Research at University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Her research is focused on practical problems and ethical issues in designing, conducting, and analyzing data from clinical trials, including surrogate endpoints, data monitoring committees, clinical trial designs, adverse event monitoring, vaccine safety, and special issues in cancer and AIDS. Uh, she was previously, in 1993 to 2004, uh, at the uh, FDA, where she served as director of the Office of Biostatistics and Epidemiology in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, CBER. She, before that, she was chief of the biostatistics research branch at, in the Division of AIDS at uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And she served in the Biometric Research Branch Cancer Therapy Evaluation Program at the NCI. I think many of you probably know Dr. Ellenberg because of her books. Uh, she has um, her book, Data Monitoring Committees and Clinical Trials, a practical perspective is one that we use here and that probably many or most of you have on your bookshelves. It was named the Wiley Europe Statistics Book for 2002. So without further ado, Dr. Susan Ellenberg. Thank you, Taddy, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, uh, about the issues of placebos in clinical trials, particularly with uh, relation to, um, to the ethical and regulatory implications. There's been a lot, lot, lot of discussion about, <clears throat> about placebos over the last uh, 15 years, and I think there's been a lot of misunderstanding um, of um, of what's actually happened as uh, as the process has developed. And having been close to the development, I thought it would be interesting to go through. Now, many of you are very well aware of some of the scientific issues, but I am going to go through those briefly um, as well. So um, the use of placebos in research has had a long history. I'll give you an example on the next slide. Um, and the use of placebo controls is generally been uh, ex well accepted in studies of investigational treatments when clearly when there's no existing treatment available uh, and you can blind, so, it's, uh, so you have a placebo control, or where treatment is not intended to have a permanent impact on health status, and that's the largest part of, um, of industrial drug development, drugs to treat symptoms. So that's been pretty... Uh, pretty standard. So here's an here's an early uh, example. This was a uh, a study of pain relief done at the uh, at uh, at <clears throat> at the end of the 1700s uh, when uh, metallic rods were used uh, to strike the body, and it was widely believed that they would relieve symptoms. I think probably people still believe in this kind of thing today. Um, uh, so uh, Hagarth prepared wooden rods to look identical to metallic rods and selected five patients with chronic rheumatism and treated them first with the wooden rods and then the metallic rods and noticed that there was really no difference in outcome. So this was an interesting early um, placebo-controlled device study, I guess you might say. So it, it's, it's, uh, there's, a, there's, a long, there's a long history. Um, it's, it's well recognized that uh, placebo controls allow for the, for the clearest estimate of absolute treatment effects. Um, but ethical concerns about the use of placebos uh, have occasionally arisen. Uh, certainly uh, many decades ago, there was concern about deception, where people were using placebos and not telling uh, people in a study that they might be getting something that wasn't an active treatment. That's been pretty much done away with with the informed consent requirements. Um, there's also been um, been uh, uh, controversy in for desperate need situations where um, there may not be any existing treatment, but it's a terrible disease and everybody's hopeful and you've had a positive, you know, phase one or phase two study and everybody is desperate to ha at least have a chance uh, to get this treatment. And here's an old uh, uh, cartoon from the AIDS era 
uh, higher mestats in 1930 to 1993 member placebo group. So that's the that's the sort of mentality. We've had this in in cancer drugs where there's an exciting new drug for cancer. Uh, I remember when I was at the FDA, there was a huge fuss about a drug for um, ALS amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, where there was a promising drug and it was a placebo-controlled trial. In fact, there was a 60 Minutes episode about it where Janet Woodcock um, uh, had to, you know, try and explain why these poor people who had a very limited life expectancy might have to be on a placebo. Of course, 60 Minutes did not do the follow-up uh, uh, show to show that that study was stopped early because the people who were on the active drug were actually doing worse than the people on the, on the placebo which is a good reason why we use placebos. Anyway, so science and ethics, of course, uh, are, is intertwined. We can't use a study design that might yield useful results, but that would be clearly unethical. And, of course, this goes back to the Nuremberg Code and, and, and long before that for right-thinking people. For example, if we wanted to do a longitudinal study of women with newly diagnosed breast cancer, not getting treatment to see, to understand what the rate of spontaneous regression of cancer was, uh, because, you know, people always wonder, you know, there's, are there, is, are there some spontaneous regressions? Well, we couldn't do that. We have life-saving treatments. We can't use a placebo. But we also know that an experiment that's not likely to yield useful results, uh, can't be ethical. Uh, there's no point in putting people to the effort and the risks of a study if you're not likely to get useful information out of it. So in considering what study designs are ethical, you also have to consider the scientific value of the information to be considered. And one thing that I learned throughout this uh, placebo debate is that people don't always get this. There may be an, something that feels unethical to them, but then when they understand the scientific issues, they kind of say, well, yeah, I get that, and maybe this really isn't so bad. Um, now, so, so this is sort of the background. And in the 1990s, two new things happened that really brought uh, issues of placebos, which had kind of been there in the background, uh, to, a, to a head. So the first event was a publication in 1994 in the New England Journal of Medicine by Ken Rothman and Karen Michaels, and this paper was entitled The Continuing Unethical Use of Placebo Controls. And Rothman and Michaels said that uh, they, they asserted that placebo controls were always unethical unless that no effective treatment was known for the condition under study. Didn't matter what you were studying. It was unethical if there was a known effective treatment. Now, they didn't try and make a, a, a really an ethical argument for this. Their argument was simply that the Declaration of Helsinki says so. Everybody knows what the Declaration of Helsinki is. Uh, the Declaration of Helsinki, the version extant at that time, had the following phrase, in any medical study, every patient, including those of a control group, if any, should be assured of the best proven diagnostic and therapeutic method. Okay? So what does that mean? Uh, nobody really had paid too much attention to this. This was added to the Declaration of Helsinki in 1975. Um, didn't really, it just sound, it's sort of a feel-good kind of statement, you know? But, um, but Rothman and Michael said this means you can't use placebos if there's a known effective treatment. They noted that many trials violate this standard. They gave lots of examples, and they argued um, that FDA policies requiring placebo-controlled trials were fostering unethical research. So that was, that was event one. Um, just to, just to uh, comment on the Declaration of Helsinki, uh, this is an international guideline. Uh, for ethics of medical experimentation. It was developed and, and it is, is maintained by the World Medical Association, which is a consortium of national medical associations. So the American Medical Association is the U.S. representative to the World Medical Association. This was first issued in 1964, kind of followed on the Nuremberg Code, which, which came out in 1949, and it's been revised numerous times by votes of the World Medical Association Council. Um, the version, as I said, the version of the declaration that Rothman and Michaels wrote about was adopted in 1975 and had received little attention. Now, this paper did not go unchallenged. Um, people pointed out that if all subjects, all subjects must get the best proven treatment, how do you ever study a new treatment? Okay? Not everybody's getting the best, the control group's getting the best proven treatment, the experimental group is getting something that you don't know whether it's going to work or not. So seems to me 
that that's the, that's the same violation. Um, and 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 the other the other challenge is why 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 should it be unethical to use a placebo in short term trials of treatments to relieve mild to moderate symptoms? Why you know it just doesn't it's not intuitively clear why that's um, why that's an ethical problem. But Rothman Michaels were very very strong on this and insisted that there were no exceptions. Uh, this is the way it was. So what's the next thing that happened? The next thing that happened was the huge debate about HIV perinatal transmission. So 1994, the same year that the Rothman and Michaels paper came out, uh, results were uh, published about an AZT-based regimen that was shown to dramatically reduce the rate of HIV infection in babies born to HIV-infected uh, mothers. Uh, and this was a study done by the AIDS Clinical Trials Group. It was actually started when I was working in the Division of AIDS. The administration of AZT began uh, for the mothers in mid-pregnancy, continued through labor and delivery, and then the babies got uh, AZT for some time. Um, now, one, once this trial, once this, when these results were out, people got very busy trying to figure out how to how to apply these results in developing countries where there were many more HIV-infected. Uh, pregnant women than there were in the United States. NIH and CDC were both, both developed trials that were being done uh, in these settings. And in designing these studies, uh, there was a big concern that, this, that this, the settings where this was done, that the actual regimen used in the, um, in the study that was uh, done by the AIDS Clinical Trials Group was not going to be feasible. Women did not routinely uh, get prenatal care. They didn't present until the baby was, until they were ready to deliver, if, if, they, if, if they did at all. Uh, there were a lot of other issues um, in these countries that, that made it difficult to implement this. Um, and so, um, so they developed a simplified regimen, uh, very different, uh, but it was ACT-based, but with much less treatment um, that, was, uh, that was going to be used as the experimental arm with a placebo control because people really didn't know whether in that setting uh, this was going to do more, um, more harm than good. Oops, wrong way. Um, <clears throat> so uh, those studies got started, and in 1997, the New England Journal of Medicine published um, another uh, paper, this one by Sidney Wolf and Peter Lurie of uh, A Public Citizen, um, who strongly attacked the ethics of the NIH and CDC-sponsored studies uh, and said that the more intensive regimen that had already been uh, shown to be effective in the U.S., often referred to as the 076 regimen because that was the number of the ACTG trial, should have been used <clears throat> as the control. Uh, and I remember actually coming, um, I think, here to Johns Hopkins, or maybe it was... Um, Maybe it was a related uh, related group that sponsored uh, sponsored a, uh, a discussion about this. Was it here? Yeah. Okay. And it was a you know it, th those of you who remember the, the discussions the discussions were very um, intense should I say about the uh, about whether or not uh, these these studies uh, these studies were ethical uh, ultimately or fairly quickly I guess the placebo controls were were dropped. So in all of these discussions, people came to these discussions from very different perspectives. You know, how many of you have read the books Flatland or have read them to your kids? You know, so you're in a different, you're in a certain world and you don't perceive things outside that world. So we have clinical trialists studying treatments for serious and life-threatening disease. If that's all they've done. You know, it's unimaginable to those people to say if you have an effective treatment that you could still use a placebo control because in their world effective treatments mean treatments that save lives or preserve essential functions. You have drug developers and also regulators who, whose major focus is treatments to relieve symptoms. They, they also do life-saving treatments but they're, they're sort of the broad. So those are people scratching their head and saying they can't use a placebo for a two-week study to test a new antihistamine? I mean, come on. Uh, you have bioethicists and public advocates who were concerned primarily about exploitation of third world countries, uh, studies being done in the third world that would be unethical to do in the United States, but the United States was going to be the primary beneficiary of these, uh, of these uh, studies done in the third world <clears throat> and these populations uh, simply being used to provide information that was going to be useful for developed countries. <clears throat> 
And then you had public health authorities trying to identify effective and affordable regimens for the third world. So you had people coming to this debate <clears throat> with all different perspectives, and it made for uh, an incredible uh, volcano of, um, of discussions. So I'm going to talk a bit about the scientific issue. Um, in, for, with, with, uh, with clinical trials and the issue of placebos, you need to distinguish two situations. One situation is when the trial, the intent of the trial is to prove that a new treatment is better than a standard treatment or that one standard treatment is better than another, and we call these superiority trials. But, and, and, and for a long time, those were mostly the, the kinds of trials that were done. But in more recent years, we do another kind of trial much more frequently, and that's a trial in which the intent is to prove that a new treatment is about as good as a standard treatment and can therefore be assumed effective. And these are, have been called non-inferiority trials, although, and they used to be called equivalence trials, and neither of those terms is really right because we don't really need to show, necessarily show that they are equivalent, and we also don't need to show that they're non-inferior. We have, I've, you know, I'm aware of uh, treatments that the FDA has approved that are clearly inferior in efficacy to an existing treatment, but they're also clearly effective at a somewhat of a lower level and have some other advantages that make it worthwhile for them to be there. So these aren't really good terms, and maybe someday somebody will find the perfect term, but for the time being, I'm going to use the term non-inferiority trials because that seems to be what's in, what's in vogue. Now, um, placebo controls and active controls both work fine in superiority trials, but active controls and non-inferiority trials can be highly problematic. And for, for many years, uh, even before this, we are, we're aware of the conundrum if, if you test a, two active treatments against each other and they come out the same, are they equally effective or equally ineffective? So, you know, that, that's a question that, uh, that is uh, not a new question, but that's the, that's the basic issue. Um, Non-inferiority -inferior, trials are typically used when one wants to show that a new treatment has about the same effect as a standard while having fewer side effects or being more convenient to administer or being less expensive to manufacture and therefore sell. Um, and, 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 I mean, people generally don't develop a drug that they don't think is going to be better in effect than something that's existing unless they feel like there's some other advantage that's going to make them, because otherwise, why would people buy it? They have to have some way to say this is going to be better because of this or that or the other thing. So some examples are when we compare a lower dose to a higher dose of the same medication. That's, uh, that's a non-inferiority trial. We want to see if we can get away with giving less. Uh, we can, might want to compare an oral formulation to an IV formulation. Clearly, that's a big advantage for, uh, for, for patients and, and probably the healthcare system because it means uh, less, uh, less uh, resources going to delivery of treatment, comparing once a week to everyday administration. So these are standard kinds of studies that I, certainly in cancer uh, have been done for, for, for many years. Many people in this debate uh, took the argument that why on earth would you even want to do a non-inferiority trial? Why would you care? If it's not better than what you've got, uh, why do we need it? And um, I, I, there was a failure to appreciate that, that better is on a broad, multivariate spectrum, and better is not just... Um, is not just effectiveness. Better has to do with toxicity and lots of other things. Um, I, uh, my, my, my husband is someone who would rather have almost any symptom in the world other than feeling nauseated. Anything else. He'd rather have a migraine. He'd <laughs> rather, you know, doesn't want to feel, doesn't want to have an upset stomach. So if there's multiple drugs for a condition that he has and one of them has nausea as a side effect and the other one doesn't, he's going to pick the one that doesn't. So that's, a, that, that's sort of another reason. Even if it's not clear that the toxicity spectrum is improved, if there are different types of toxicities, it allows different people to, to use their own value systems and choose which one they want. I'm going to give you a super oversimplified uh, example of the, of the, of the problem with non-inferiority trials. Um, treatment X has been compared to placebo in five studies, and the effect sizes are 10, 4, 16, 0, and 8. Pretty variable. Um, the three highest effect sizes showed a significant difference. The drug was approved. The trials were all designed similarly with adequate power and performed in apparently similar populations, and I will tell you this is not an uncommon scenario. Um, so... Yeah, for a lot of reasons that I may go into. So now we have new treatment Y. We compare it to treatment X. 
the outcomes are similar. Can we conclude that treatment Y is effective? After all, uh, treatment X is approved. We decide, we've decided that it is effective. Well, maybe it is effective if in that study X had an effect of eight or more. But maybe not if in that study X had an effect of four or less. All right? We could, you know, could happen. We've already seen those kinds of examples. Without a placebo arm, we don't know what the effect of X was in that trial. We know that the effect of X can vary for reasons that we can't figure out. And so when we compare Y with X and get the same answer, we really don't know where we are with Y and whether Y is effective. And that's really the fundamental uh, dilemma with non-inferiority trials. Conclusion of non-inferiority requires the critical assumption that the effect of the active control in this study is as good or better as it was in earlier studies. It's really similar to the assumptions made in historically controlled trials. Uh, anybody who's a little bit suspicious of uh, conclusions made on the basis of historically controlled trials should also be suspicious of uh, re of results made in, in uh, active control trials, and, and you need a lot of other information to make you feel comfortable about it. The validity of the conclusion rests on an unverifiable assumption of the consistency of effect across studies and over time. And anybody who reads the biopharmaceutical statistics journals, of which there are several now, will know that there have been a multitude, multitude, multitude of papers published over the last 10 to 15 years uh, putting forward uh, co uh, concepts and methods for trying to assess consistency over time, how to uh, assess other aspects of non-inferiority trials. Consistency often does not hold in trials of symptom relief, trials of, uh, to treat pain or depression or anxiety or allergic rhinitis or GERD or hypertension, which is not really a symptom, but is also subject to these, um, to these widely, varying, uh, widely varying outcomes. In, in these studies, there's a lot of reasons why um, you don't have consistency. Uh, first of all, symptoms wax and wane. You may have a study where you get people who, um, who are on the decline, they're all going to be better, and, um, and you don't really know that because you can't really tell what the population is going to be like when you put them in. The response rates vary widely for reasons that we have not been able to identify. The effect sizes are generally modest. So it's pretty easy with this extra variability to go from zero effect to a large effect. The placebo response rates are high. And, and in placebo response rates, um, th there's a lot of things that go in. Bob, Bob Temple doesn't like to hear the phrase placebo response rates because a lot of a placebo response rate is regression to the mean when you put people in who because their score is, you know, over a certain level or under a certain level. Um, there, are, there are a lot of things that go into response rates besides the psychological issue of, oh, I think I'm going to get better, so I am going to feel better, which is what people usually mean by a placebo response rate. The, 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 the measures uh, of effect that we have are variable. There's a lot of reasons, but people have not been able to figure out and s sort this out, so they have settled for this amount of noise uh, in studies and just say, okay, you got to do four, five, six, seven studies and finally convince us. You got enough of them that show a significant effect. We'll believe that it's, uh, we'll believe that it's effective. I should say in the area of depression, um, the sample sizes used to be very, very small and they've gone up substantially and you still see this pattern. So it's not just a matter of sample size. All right. So, Again, if there's no proven or standard treatment, placebo controls are generally non-controversial. H1N1 vaccine trials, placebo controlled. Didn't have any vaccine for H1N1 before last year. Treatments for Meniere's disease, I put that in there because my son-in-law has that. It's a horrible thing where you get uh, uncontrollable dizziness and there's no, there's a lot of anecdotal stuff, but there's really no established treatment for this. Uh, if you've got, a, if you've got a, a disease where there's no known treatment, people aren't going to complain about placebo controls, except in unusual situations like the ALS example that I mentioned before, or um, uh, something where it's a bad disease and there's no treatment. Everybody wants uh, to try an active treatment. If a proven treatment prolongs life or prevents serious irreversible consequences short of death, Placebos are almost never appropriate, okay? So those are two areas where there's not so much controversy, but then 
There's a whole lot of other things in between. So here are some easy cases where there's a clear impact on mortality or major morbidity. Chemotherapy for many cancers, thrombolytics post-MI, antiviral drugs for HIV. We're not doing placebo controls with a new, with a new uh, drug in any of these categories, okay? Or when there's no impact on mort mortality or major morbidity. Analgesics, wrinkle removers. If we have a new alternative to Botox, is it unethical to use a placebo control? You know? Um, I, I, maybe Ken Rothman would still say so. I don't know. But uh, I know Karen Michaels has backed off of that because um, I talked to her about it last year. Anti-acne drugs, uh, anti-impotence drugs. Um, I think for most people, they don't have a problem with placebo controls for these because you, for, for, for drugs to treat symptoms, you really want to know that it's effective and that it's effectively safe and the best you're going to get the most reliable answer. Um, with a placebo control. But there certainly is room for debate in many other cases which are harder. What if there's no evidence of harm from remaining untreated, but there's concern that harm is possible? So some years ago, uh, there was a, a you know, concern that antidepressants uh, might increase suicide risk. Of course, before that, people were concerned about placebo controls because people not on antidepressants might have an increased suicide risk. But then people did big meta-analyses and said, well, maybe there's an increased suicide risk. If you take an antidepressant, uh, maybe it just makes you active enough that you can go through with what you've just been thinking about. Lots of, lots of thoughts. So, so if, if, you, if you think about that, is that a, is, 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 is that a problem? What if there's known harm from long-term non-use of therapy, but no known or no established harm from short-term non-use? So we routinely use, do short-term studies of new antihypertensive drugs using placebo controls in people who, if they have um, even mild hypertension, would probably be put on an antihypertensive. Is it ethical to keep them off of that antihypertensive for four weeks or six weeks or whatever to do the study? So there, you know, we could have a debate about that, and I think there could be legitimate arguments on both sides. Same with lipid-lowering drugs. Short-term studies be very hard to show uh, a, a clear increased risk, but can't rule it out. Sometimes there's different views on benefit or risk-benefit ratio. Some years ago, the FDA approved a treatment for sepsis, first, first uh, drug approved for sepsis after many, many, many failures. Um, most people didn't like it. I know at Penn, this is still not really uh, widely used. The drug, it's a lily drug, and it's called Zygris. Um, if people aren't using it, if they don't like it, if they don't really believe in it, if they're worried about the side effects, then is it unethical if, you, if somebody else has another sepsis drug that maybe doesn't have uh, some of the side effects, it doesn't look like it has some of the side effects of the first one, is it unethical to use a placebo control? Pertussis vaccines is another example. Back uh, uh, in the 70s and 80s, there was huge uh, concerns about the uh, toxicities of the whole cell uh, pertussis vaccine, which was widely used, which was essentially mandated in this country and most developed countries to prevent whooping cough, but, but it, it was reactogenic. And while uh, there was not any solid evidence that it really caused any major uh, serious problems, there were people who were concerned, and it's very difficult. Babies, the first year of life is the highest risk uh, year that there is until you get old, and some kids develop serious neurological problems, and when you give them vaccines at two, four, and six months at the same time that these problems develop, there's going to be some, certainly some coincidental events, and you're not going to know whether it had anything to do with the vaccine or not. So there was a big debate about that. Uh, an acellular vaccine was developed that was less reactogenic, and how was it studied? In the U.S., it was not studied in the U.S. because um, because pe everybody was getting the whole cell vaccine, uh, despite the concerns. Most people were getting it, so there was no whooping cough. So you wouldn't be able to evaluate the drug. This was tested in Sweden and Italy, where people were more concerned about the, uh, about the uh, toxicities, and pertussis vaccines were not being used in those countries routinely. So those were placebo-controlled trials done with the acellular pertussis vaccine in Sweden and Italy would have been thought unethical in the U.S., was not thought unethical in Sweden and Italy. Um, so uh, there, there's, there, there's, there can be cases where there's differences of opinion on risk and benefit. Um, there's, been, there's been a huge amount of debate about the use of placebo controls in countries where proven treatment is not generally available. 
um, either, uh, or it's not available for anybody except the, the, the tiny percentage of people who actually have a lot of money in those countries. Placebo-controlled trials would be considered unethical in the United States. <clears throat> the active agents used in the United States are not feasible for use in these countries due to the expense or a lack of infrastructure to administer it. Um, there, there certainly can be concerns about whether an active treatment that's proven in the United States will have, will even have a beneficial effect in a very different environment where the background support of care isn't there, where the diets are different, where the genetics may be somewhat different. Um, so those are arguments that can be made, but there are certainly very strong opposing arguments that, uh, and concerns that such trials will exploit poor countries. Uh, and that has to be taken very, very seriously. Um, there's also been people who argue that when you do a trial in a developing country and get an answer, even if that drug is not immediately available in that country, at least some people in the country get active treatment, and maybe it paves the way for future availability having been done there. So what's the harm if some people get it, but not everybody? Isn't that better than nobody getting it? So there are lots of debates about these, um, lots of debates about these issues. I think one interesting question that hasn't really been uh, addressed too much is whether individuals volunteering, this is back to the symptom issue, should individuals volunteering for a short-term study to evaluate a new drug's ability control mild to moderate symptoms or lifestyle issues like reducing wrinkles or improving erections, should those really be considered more, should those be considered more like a patient coming to a physician for treatment, which is kind of what the Declaration of Helsinki addresses, or should they be considered like healthy subjects signing up for phase one studies, which the Declaration of Helsinki doesn't seem to object to. Uh, those people have uh, no benefit uh, other than whatever financial remuneration they get, and they have risks. But we do phase one studies all the time, and nobody's complaining that, in general, phase one studies are unethical. So I think it could be argued that individuals going into a two-week or four-week short-term study for, for symptom relief uh, who understand, who have a good informed consent about what, what the issue is, know they can drop out if they can't stand that their nose is continuing to run and they want to go, you know, back and take their Allegra or Claritin or whatever. Um, you know, whether that's really more like a healthy person in a phase one study than a sick person who's coming to their physician for treatment. So now let's talk about the, the, the fallout in terms of uh, documents and regulation and discussion. So what about the Declaration of Helsinki? So um, 1975 was the version uh, that uh, Rothman and Michaels were talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, there was a minor change made in 1989, but I'm going to talk about the changes that were made after the Rothman-Michaels paper, and those changes were made in 1996 and 2000 and 2004 and 2008. The current version reads, the benefits, risks, burdens, and effectiveness of a new intervention must be tested against those of the best current proven intervention, except in the following circumstances. One, the use of placebo or no treatment is acceptable in studies where no current proven intervention exists. Okay, nobody's fussing too much about that. Or where for compelling and scientifically sound methodological reasons, the use of placebo is necessary to determine the efficacy or safety of an intervention, and the patients who receive placebo or no treatment will not be subject to any risk of serious or irreversible harm. Extreme care must be taken to avoid abuse of this option. So this is the way it reads now. It's still not right. Some of you may be aware of this. The or, there's a little button here. Well, I don't know where to press it, but in the, um, in the first sub-bullet, there's an or at the end. And that or is not right, because um, if there are compelling and sound scientific reasons and you can't get an answer without a placebo control, you still can't use a placebo control um, if it's going to bring, uh, wait, wait a minute, um, no, no, okay, they fixed it. They, they, did, they did something in the middle where there was an or and it let, made it look like, it made it look, that's right, they, that was in the 2004 version, they made it look like if, if you needed it scientifically, you could do it even if people were subject to serious or irreversible harm, but they have fixed it in the 2008, in the 2008 issue, okay. So here's some history of the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, it was first published in 1964, as I mentioned. It was amended 
all of these following times, starting in 1975. Lots of amendments. So it's kind of like the Constitution, you know. It's not a, uh, it's not a fixed, rigid uh, document uh, brought down from, the, uh, from Mount Sinai. These are all of the changes that were made in response to the debates about um, placebos and also access to, to, to care. So most of the, there's been a lot of activity uh, since 1996 on this issue. And um, I don't think we can be absolutely sure uh, that it's finished. Um, what happened in 1996? After the Rothman-Michaels paper, um, there was strong lobbying to have the declaration modified. Uh, to clarify the statement that all subjects in trials must receive best proven treatment. Because you had Rothman and Michaels over here saying it means you can never use placebos if there's no existing treatment. And you had people over here saying that's ridiculous for the reasons that, uh, that I mentioned before. The American Medical Association actually came out with a statement in June of 1996 uh, supporting the view that placebo controls were not always unethical when there was proven treatment, that there would be circumstances when they were okay. But nevertheless, so, so there was some optimism that in 1996 this, this was going to be clarified, um, but the 1996 change simply added wording that said placebo controls are okay if we don't have any existing uh, treatment for the condition under study, which nobody debated. So that didn't satisfy, um, didn't, didn't really clarify what was before, and certainly didn't satisfy the people who thought that the Rothman-Michaels interpretation was wrong. Um, between 1996 and 2000, uh, there was continued debate in the literature regarding uh, what the Declaration of Helsinki meant. Um, and um, the Wolf-Lurie paper, which was published in 1997, surely intensified the debate with the added emotional trigger of the concern about exploitation of developing countries, which for a good while basically took over the debate. People kind of forgot about this issue of, you know, short-term treatment of uh, runny noses and were very much focused on uh, serious diseases in developing countries where the issue was could you actually do, could you actually implement the, the active control in the U.S. and could you be sure that it was going to work in the same way. So the World Medical Association established a working group to reconsider the Declaration of Helsinki wording on placebos. They recognized that there was really a huge international debate uh, a proposed revision was issued in 1999 and was widely and very passionately discussed. I remember attending a meeting in London in 1999 sponsored by the, the Nuffield uh, group, and um, people were just yelling at each other, and nobody was listening to anybody. One person would say something, and then somebody would say something else and, and was not responding. People were just talking at each other. It was very, very, very emotional. So in 2000, uh, a revision was finally approved by the uh, World Medical Association Council and issued, and this revision made it crystal clear that placebos were not to be used when there was proven therapy. So this was the wording in, um, in, uh, 19, in, in 2000. The benefits, risks, burdens, and effectiveness of a new method should be tested against those of the best current prophylactic, diagnostic, and therapeutic methods. This does not excuse, exclude use of placebo or no treatment in studies where no proven prophylactic, diagnostic, or therapeutic method exists. So this looks like what I just showed you for the current version, except it doesn't have the accept in cases part at the end. So, so, so this took the very stringent position. So what happened then? Also, in this version, wording was added that addressed concerns about exploitation, and it specified that at the conclusion of the study, every patient entered into the study should be assured of access to the best proven prophylactic, diagnostic, and therapeutic methods identified by the study. Uh, now, this, uh, this also generated a firestorm of discussion. Um, I'm not focusing on this part so much now because I'm talking about the placebo issue, but these two things were synergistic in terms of the, uh, in terms of the amount of passion that was there. So, um, so the attacks on the new version just intensified. They were already intense when the proposed version was released, and it just uh, intensified. Um, drug developers, regulatory agencies, other clinical trial funders um, um, like NIH and the CDC made it clear that the, 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 the proscriptions, the prohibitions in the new version were very problematic and, and in a lot of cases really didn't make a lot of sense. Um, and concerns were raised, and this was particularly a concern for um, federal funders in the U.S. who were trying to develop treatments for developing countries, that the requirement for assured access to best treatment identified in the study was unrealistic for multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, 
you know, the best treatment identified in the study might not be the best treatment. Uh, the best treatment identified in the study might be the control treatment, which was never available in the country. If taken seriously, this would simply halt research in developing countries. Uh, and the, um, you know, from a utilitarian viewpoint, this was not good. This would mean not no advance because these countries themselves did not have the infrastructure to support uh, the kind of research that the NIH and the CDC could support. So, so what happened after that? Um, there were more meetings, and there were more publications, and the World Medical Association, to their credit, acknowledged uh, this continuing controversy. They did not dig in their heels. They established another working group to reconsider the concerns that had been raised and to enter into discussions with other groups that had already issued or were planning to issue some guidelines. Uh, and then in 2002, they issued clarifications regarding both the placebo issue and the access to best treatment issue. So uh, I'm not going to read this, but the clarification on placebos is very similar to what I showed you for what's in the current version. Only in 2002, it was, it was, it said you can't use placebos. That was the same thing. But then it was at the bottom, it said clarification. Uh, and the clarification basically says, well, we didn't really mean that. Um, so, uh, uh, so that was, um, that was, um, you know, satisfactory, I think, to most of the people who, um, who were, who were debating this, although it certainly, the faction of people who felt very strongly about not allowing placebos then were enraged by this, uh, backpedaling. Go back and show us how that was like um, yeah, how do I go back? Uh, let's see. Now. Yeah. What, what do you, so, so. This, this, this part, this part doesn't, this part, this, it doesn't deal with that. There was another clarification that said, um, that said consideration should be, you know, they should be, have access to the best identified or other appropriate treatment. Something like that. It gave, it gave an out. But I, I, I didn't, I didn't add that. So there were two clarifications. This is just the one on placebos. Um, about the same time, there were other ethics guidelines being issued. The, the CEOMS, the Council for International Organizations of Medical Sciences, which is affiliated with the World Health Organization, published a detailed guideline in 2002, which basically started with the elements of the Declaration of Helsinki, but then included a discussion of each item, and in that document indicated the acceptability of placebo controls in many circumstances, even when there was proven treatment. And similarly, the Nuffield Council of Bioethics from the UK also published a 2002 guideline providing a similar perspective. So the World Medical Association was kind of, you know, they were still facing this huge uh, world reaction, uh, plus uh, other international ethical documents were taking uh, a much less stringent position that they had taken. So um, the current status of the Declaration of Helsinki, the most recent revision was in 2008. It incorporated the clarifications on placebo use and standard of care issue in the main document. There is a remaining faction within and outside the World Medical Association that thinks that this change was wrong, that we should go back to the 2000 version. Uh, last February, I attended a uh, World Medical Association workshop in Sao Paulo, Brazil, to readdress these issues, uh, and there was a fair amount of discussion. Um, it was a, it's a small faction, um, at least a small faction of people attending the workshop, um, who um, who were uncomfortable with the new approach. Um, but um, from my, my sense from that workshop and talking to uh, some of the leaders of the WMA is that there's no expectation that there's going to be any further changes on this issue uh, in, the, in the foreseeable future. But, but you never know because uh, people are very, very passionate about these issues. So now I'm going to talk about FDA regulations because I think there's been there's been a lot of, also a lot of discussion about how this issue has impacted FDA and, and its uh, regulatory uh, its regulatory perspective. FDA <coughs> had a long-standing regulation on use of foreign clinical studies that were not done under an IND. So if a company wants a study to uh, to be used in support of approval of a product, they 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 are supposed to do it under an investigational new drug application. Sometimes studies are done not under an IND in other countries. 
Um, and in those, in that case, FDA has a regulation that says, we will consider such studies, even if they weren't done under an IND, if they are conducted in accordance with the Declaration of Helsinki or that company, or that country's regulations, whichever was stricter. So that was a long-standing regulation in Part 312 uh, of, of when you could consider uh, for, uh, for support of a marketing application, a non-IND study. That wasn't, the only cons that wasn't the only requirement, but that was one of the requirements. The Declaration of Helsinki was specifically listed as you have to be conducted in accordance with the Declaration of Helsinki. Now, when these changes were made in the Declaration of Helsinki, you know, the FDA said, oops, you know, how, how is it that we had something in our regulation that we have no control over? You know, if we cite something that somebody else is controlling, God knows what they could say in there, and then we'd kind of be stuck with it. So, um, uh, so what did the FDA do? The first, they did the simplest thing, is they issued a clarification. This could be done without, uh, without too much uh, effort and paperwork. They issued a clarification that the regulation referred to the version of the Declaration of Helsinki that was, um, that was there when this regulation was written, which happened to be the 1989 version, which had that uh, wishy-washy statement about uh, controls that note that that can be interpreted anyway. All right, but that wasn't really terribly satisfactory to say. Well, okay, we, we say everybody has to abide by the 1989 version of the Declaration of Helsinki when in fact there's lots of um, there's lots of changes. So in 2004, FDA issued a proposed rule that specified that foreign studies to be used in support of a marketing application must have been done in accordance with good clinical practice remove the reference to the Declaration of Helsinki. And in the preamble to this rule, those of you who are interested in, in regulations in FDA, it's, it's very interesting to, to read when the rule is first published in the Federal Register, they will publish a preamble. And they go through a lot of the rationale for that rule. And especially when they publish the final rule, they'll actually discuss all the comments that they got in response to the proposed rule and how they, and they have to do this. Uh, and, and, and whether they accepted or rejected the comment can be very interesting reading, especially when you are really, really interested in a particular new regulation. Anyway, they explained in the preamble to the rule that basing requirements, basing FDA, basing, uh, FDA requirements, not just guidance, but requirements on a document that was not under U.S. control was simply not acceptable. It was, in fact, it was illegal, and it was not really recognized until this document changed in a way that was thought to be inconsistent with FDA policies. Uh, they, they noted that retaining reference, simply retaining reference to the 1989 version of the declaration would have been confusing as because they, it's hard to find the 1989 version. If you go to the World Medical Association website, you see the new version. Not so easy to find old versions. Um, this rule after four years was finalized in 2008. So what, what is this good clinical practice that's taking the place of the Declaration of Helsinki? As defined in the new rule, it's defined as the standard for design, conduct, performance, monitoring, auditing, recording, analysis, and reporting of clinical trials in a way that provides assurance that the data and reported results are credible and accurate and that the rights, safety, and well-being of trial subjects are protected. And it includes review and approval by an independent ethics committee before study initiation and continuing review and obtaining and documenting freely given informed consent of study subjects. So it's, it's, it's fairly intense, and it's, it's a pretty much a worldwide standard. So the FDA action uh, has been, you know, interpreted uh, by many as, well, the FDA is trashing the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, and um, I will not deny that there are people within the FDA who don't have a lot of respect for the process after, after what has happened for the WNA process. However, the reason for getting rid of it is a legal reason. Is, is recognizing that you can't put something in a U.S. regulation that the U.S. doesn't have control over. And, and the motivation was seeing that, in fact, they did something that was inconsistent. In, in, uh, in the, um, in the uh, preamble to the rule, FDA was very open about its disagreement with the 2000 revision, and they said that what, was in the what had been put into the declaration, the revision was inconsistent with U.S. laws and policy, and it would impose a standard for clinical trials that is at odds with the current existing standards for adequate and well-controlled investigations. Um, so it, it, it was, can you say it was, was taken out because FDA disagreed with this? Well, 
yes and no. Uh, the fact that FDA disagreed with it was the motivation, but it was taken out because of the general principle that you can't have something in a, in a U.S. regulation that people by law have to adhere to when the U.S. doesn't have any control over that. Um, so it was recognized that, that this should, the Declaration of Helsinki should never have been part of U.S. regulation. And in fact, it's not mentioned in any other part of the regulations. It doesn't say anything about Declaration of Helsinki in studies done under an IND or done in this country. The only place it's referred to is uh, studies not conducted under an IND in foreign countries. So um, just to summarize, placebo controls, widely accepted in some circumstances, controversial in others. Uh, that's going to continue. People have different value judgments. There's always going to be issues where people are going to debate whether a placebo control uh, is ethical or not. They're often used in studies of new drugs to control symptoms. Uh, and again, even there, there can be some debate depending on the seriousness of the symptoms. Uh, use of active controls in many types of studies would lead to difficulty in interpretation and either an increased risk of accepting ineffective drugs or uh, halting of drug development in certain areas. Um, I suspect FDA would not be accepting, be, be approving drugs that they thought might be ineffective because they didn't, didn't believe the studies with active controls. Um, greater use of active controls in new drug studies would actually, I, I didn't mention this in the talk, uh, but it would increase exposure of many to potentially ineffective drugs because active control studies tend to be uh, larger than placebo control trials. And while Brothman and Michaels made much of that, saying that the reason you want, you know, FDA wants and to placebo controls is because drug companies want to do cheaper, smaller studies, the truth is, is that a very large proportion of studies that are done uh, the treatment turns out not to be useful, may actually be harmful, in any case will have side effects, and more people are exposed then to those problems, and that doesn't seem to be such a good thing. <clears throat> there is little that is intuitively unethical uh, about short-term placebo control trials of new treatments for symptoms, at least to me, and I think to a lot of people. The placebo issues uh, generated substantial debate and motiva motivated numerous conferences and publications. Um, individuals concerned about trial participants in developing countries who might not get life-saving treatments were really not very interested in arguments about, um, about placebo controls for short-term trials of symptom relief. That, 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 you know, they didn't care. They wanted something that stopped this horrendous exploitation of, of, of people in developing countries. Individuals more familiar with a wide range of studies perceived the anti-placebo arguments as naive and unscientific. And it was just a, a perfect situation for, like I said, just a firestorm uh, of, uh, of debate. Um, this debate fueled multiple revisions of the Declaration of Helsinki and other uh, international ethics documents and changes in FDA regulations. And I will just conclude by going back to this, um, this cartoon about the person who died as a member of the placebo group and showing you another cartoon that appeared a few years later with somewhat different perspective. Would you like to volunteer to test a new medication? Only if I get the placebo. Thank you very much. Taddy? Um, to your pretty much last point about the Declaration of Helsinki and FDA and so forth, we've both been at meetings where uh, people from other countries are really outraged about this whole thing. And so I'm just wondering if there's any way to, uh, I mean, the, this is WHO of people, and, you know, it's part of the UN, and the U.S. signs on to UN things. Which is WHO people? Well, I think these are the people who are upset or people connected to the WHO, and the people I've heard of meetings we've both been at have been WHO representatives. Well, but the, the CEOMS document takes the, you know, takes the view of the current uh, okay. WMA, and that's really more associated with WHO. Uh, uh, so I continue to get the email traffic on it, and I guess my question is, is there any way to take this out of the FDA, for example, you know, whether it's a, a U.S. rig and look at it more um, as a member of the U.N., you know, where we have agreements that aren't really necessarily based in our legislation, as far as I know, about war and, and some such things, but where we can try to be more a part of 
uh, the world or explain it. I think the way it's explained now just gets people mad. Well, it's not U.S., so um, so we won't sign on to it. So can we take the whole discussion about Helsinki and, well, gee, this thing keeps changing or whatever the discussion is and, and say, yeah, it's good now. We can sign on to the 2008. But, I, I mean, I think there is a political aspect to this that I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about because it continues to rankle people. Well, it does continue to rankle people, but I think the uh, I think a large a large proportion of people who were initially outraged have come to understand some of the scientific bases, and I think a lot of people who were initially enraged didn't really understand the issues about you know you make a very broad rule like that, and then you stop studies that they didn't really think were unethical to stop. And so the way the current declaration re reads, um, I think it's more consistent with what really most people, um, you know, what most pe the way most people look at it. But as I said, there is a, there is a remaining faction of people who are unhappy about it. Um, I think that I don't know that there's any place in any, you know, it's not just the FDA in any United States regulation or law that relies on something that somebody else could change. Um, that's you know that that's just just a legal issue. It's it's a it, it's it's not the U.S. is better. It's just we have to be consistent with our own uh, you know with our own laws. And um, so I, I don't know. I'm not sure that the United Nations is a place where I think of <laughs> bringing people together to come to a nice happy uh, happy consensus. Um, and and I, I do think that there's a value judgment here. I think there are, you know, there are going to be a fair amount of individual studies where there is going to be definite reason disagreement about whether placebo control is appropriate. Uh, and I think that some of that is going to be handled by individual, invest, you know, institutional review boards uh, to determine. There are certainly are studies now that some IRBs say no to, other IRBs say yes. Uh, if a study, if the FDA thinks a study is okay with a placebo control, but the rest of the world doesn't think so, nobody's going to go into it. Nobody's forced to go into a study. Uh, and so, you know, I don't think there's, I don't think, I don't think that there's a hope to get everybody in complete agreement on this. But I think where we are now is probably the best consensus we'll get. Steve. Um, comment and then a question. I think it really is critical to separate, which you partially did, um, wasn't done in the world, this issue of doing research in an unfair world under, with unfair background conditions, which is really what the issue is with the developing world yeah. controversy. And it, it exists in this country and in, in underserved populations, underserved communities, just as much as it does in the developing world. And that's a very complicated conversation, which would use concepts and words and, and, and issues that, that aren't touched on here. And you can't resolve it through just technical discussions about placebo. That, that's just a vehicle to get into that much more complicated conversation. I think that's why that is not resolvable through this uh, technical language. And, and, it, and it involves very, very complicated issues, which I think ethicists still have not, uh, and political scientists and, and whatever have not uh, grappled with. So I think that's why this conversation is so impoverished in addressing that much bigger problem, and I don't, I don't think we can even begin to attempt to do it. This is one tiny operational piece, right? Of, and it, it, of it's, that debate. it's true, and that that was why a lot of people are unhappy about the Declaration of Helsinki moving in the direction of being very specific, you know, and and feel like as an initial statement of general principles, you know, it was a you know it was a reasonable thing to look toward. But as it gets more specific and says you can't do this, you can't do that you get into these kinds right. of complications. So I think it, it, it's, a, it's a hopeless conversation to have in the absence of people who can talk about these other things, and it can't really be done through these regulations. But here's the, the question, which is uh, on slightly different territory. This notion of you know, best proven treatment. Well, <laughs> every, every study is done in a new population, and you get arguments of, well, is it proven in that population? I mean, Al knows he proved vitamin A and country after country, they say, well, it wasn't proven in this country, it wasn't proven in that country, we, it's not proven in six, over 60, it's not proven in under 18, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that statement of that's proven uh, treatment becomes very, very difficult and, and contentious as it uh, stands, and this is now entering into this new comparative effect of this research, where this gets really complicated, and, I, and I'd be very interested to hear your 
<laughs> and genomics. Yes, and I'd be interested to hear uh, your thoughts about how this is playing out in this in, in this new era with an emphasis on you know quote unquote head to head comparisons, active comparisons, uh, trying it out in, in broader populations where in fact treatments are not completely proven. Well, um, I, I, you know you, your your question is kind of more complicating the issue because. Uh, it, it's, it, you know, I, I think, I think it's hard enough. I mean, I, I think it's, 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 it's hard enough to even understand what could be meant by best proven treatment, even in the abstract, without raising all these other things. We, we don't know. It, it, it's not even just a question of subgroups, which, uh, you know, is a, is a, is a, is always a question. But you know other aspects of, of 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 the background, or even whether the results are believable. You know, you have a new study, and it seems to be better than this active control. But you know, maybe another study showed another treatment was better than the active control, and maybe it was a little bit better. And so, which one is really best? And you know, often no, people don't know what's best. And the comparative effectiveness world is trying to sort that out. But they're going to be faced with a lot of challenges. A uh, huge amount of challenges, uh, many, many stemming from the, the simple conundrum of equally effective or equally ineffective uh, in studies. So it just, it, it, it's one more place where it's complicating the issue. And I think, again, demonstrates that um, trying to keep things to general principles and not be specific in these kinds of ethical statements is, is probably where we want to be. Yes, in the back. I was wondering what you think, uh, oh, by the way, it's an excellent talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering what you think of uh, active placebos. So placebos that are designed to mimic the, just the side effects. They have no therapeutic benefit of just mimicking side effects of a class of drugs. So there was a meta study, a concurrent collaboration meta study of trials of a certain kind of antidepressant versus placebos designed to simulate these um, side effects. And they showed there was the gain in antidepressants versus the active placebo was much smaller than in other studies. Um, of antidepressant versus um, sugar. I was wondering, but there's certainly ethical questions that come up in assigning someone at random to just give them a uh, the size. Well, I, I have never been a fan of those kinds of studies. I first became aware of those studies when I was working in AIDS research, and I learned that the studies of didanosine, DDI, uh, which was given at that time in something called a sachet, that the vehicle for delivering it was going to was was what was causing the gastrointestinal side effects of the drug, and people liked that because it was really blinding it. I, I personally, you know, would would you know don't like that. I, I think you know there are, there are things that we can do to make studies more rigorous uh, and to improve the validity and integrity. And the, we can, there was only so far we can go to do that without we're without. Um, uh, you know, I think crossing a line. To me, that crosses the line, but many people disagree with that, and I don't, I don't know. I mean, these studies were, were these kinds of controls were standardly used in, in FDA studies, and they may still be standardly used in FDA studies. I don't know what the, I've been away from FDA now for six years, and the part of FDA that I was in, in biologics, the side effects were so bad, nobody would try to mimic them. I mean, the biologics are all dangerous, so, you know, you aren't going to make people susceptible to infections and death uh, in order to blind the study. So I, I don't know what the current thinking is, but I, I have a big problem with making people sick in order to blind the study. Tom? Just to, I, I, to pick up on Steve's point, I think the devil is always in the details. And what I'd really like to see the Helsinki Declaration and these other alphabet soups come up with is the general principles and a more sociological statement about constitution of appropriate teams for dealing with these situations in various instances. And so that you make sure that a protocol team has on it, and we could go through the list, but let's not bother, the right players, because I think that's the way you end up having the chance of being ethical, and that is to have the right scientific and community representation skill sets on these teams to go through these issues in every specific instance. And that seems to be missing from almost all of these declarations. Well, again, you have to worry about being too prescriptive. You know, uh, does every clinical trial that's done need to have a community representative on the protocol team? There are plenty of studies in which you would say that would be a really important addition. I mean, you could be a bit wishy-washy, but I think at least well, make it... Well, wishy-washy means 
stating the general principles. And, okay. and but that piece of the general principle should be in there, I think. Something about a team constituted to <coughs> have the right skills and, if you'd like, uh, sociological viewpoints. Well, I, you know, I can't just agree with that, but again, the devil's in the details because, as you said, because, um, you know, there could be, you could have the right people, but if they have a perspective that's not your perspective, they're going to come up with something that you're going to think is wrong. You know, there's there's no way to, to get away from the fact that there's going to be value judgments here. Not everybody is always going to agree. Um, Kurt, you had a comment before. Oh, no, I was just wondering whether or not the the workaround of the FDA to get rid of the, the reference to Declaration of Helsinki and to talk about good clinical practice, isn't that the same thing? I mean, they don't control the... the that isn't legislated. Well, they what they no. So so there's that that's a, that's an interesting point, and it is a little bit I think of a of a dance there because good clinical practice is defined in the regulations. It is not referring to the ICH document, the Internet, the International Conference on Harmonization document on good clinical practice, which is in fact a guidance. Uh, but it is something that the FDA bought into, and it is an FDA guidance. But you're correct. It is not a regulation. It's a guidance. So you're not allowed to say you have to uh, act according to the guidance. So they were careful when they wrote this rule to define good clinical practice within the rule uh, and not refer to the International Conference on Harmonization. But it is certainly could be considured a, a sidestep. <laughs> it's not. It, well, it's not exquisitely defined. It's defined exactly as I showed you. That's that's how it's defined. So it's a bit of a sidestep. Yes, Dan. I know we're in a clinical trial seminar, but um, I wonder what role well-conducted observational studies uh, have to do, or, or what kind of role they play in this debate at all. So, for example, you gave some illustrations of you know some physicians, you know, may not be interested in prescribing a certain you know, drug, whereas others may be interested in prescribing. So, there's sort of natural experiments that might be available uh, to sort of learn a little bit about the effectiveness of the treatment versus control. Um, well, a clinical trial is not doesn't have to have a concurrent randomized control group. So I've been talking about randomized controlled trials, but you know you can have a trial with a historically controlled group or even a literature control group, which would be essentially an observational study. So I think well, that's a, probably not the best observational study. But, uh, well. But, but, but I think any time you give an intervention to people with the, with the idea of seeing how it affects their health, that's a clinical trial, whether it has a concurrent control group or not. And I think all these policies would, um, you know, the, the, the Declaration of Helsinki certainly, and, and much of what it says, would apply to those. Obviously, discussions about what the control group should be is, uh, is separate from an observational study. So all the discussion I'm about... I'm suggesting there may be circumstances, or maybe not very many, but where you can learn about uh, the effectiveness of a treatment versus placebo or without, versus no treatment without having to randomize someone to placebo. Uh, there's no question about that. People always talk about penicillin. And I am certain that if somebody came up with a, a drug in a phase one or phase two study in pancreas cancer where they gave it to five patients and they all had a complete response, I don't think there would ever be a uh, controlled study of that uh, of that drug, but those those circumstances, as you said, are going to be few and far between. Okay, Kay says we have this. Time. I'm sorry, this is, but uh, maybe Dr. Elberg has some time now. <coughs> if you have a specific question, come on down. So okay. I only have till you're meeting with me yeah. so. uh, at ten or whenever. Yeah, yeah. 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 We'll do it till ten. Okay. okay. All right. And we have the room. You gave uh, Marsha Angel a pass. That's the one who set up that whole. <laughs> Well, I, I didn't want to take valuable time to, to <laughs> <laughs> castigate personalities, but... Um.